The International Institute of Humanitarian Law's Manual on the Law of Non-International Armed Conflict, alluded to earlier in the conference, separates people involved or in the vicinity of a NIAC into two broad classes, fighters and civilians. Fighters are defined as members of armed forces and dissident armed forces or other organized armed groups, with the exception of medical or religious personnel, or those taking active or direct part in hostilities. Civilians are defined as all those who are not fighters. Whether or not one is a fighter or a civilian has consequences both as to what one can do in a NIAC and what one can have done to him or her. For example, civilians cannot be directly targeted, whereas fighters can. The potential incidental deaths and injuries to civilians that may be expected as a result of an attack must be weighed against the concrete and direct military advantage anticipated from that attack, with the attack being forbidden as a matter of law if the incidental civilian deaths or injuries would be excessive in relation to the advantage gained. No such calculus must be made with fighters. On the other hand, civilians may not take an active or direct part in hostilities. If they do, they lose their status as civilians and the protections that go along with it. For these reasons and more, a person's status as a fighter or a civilian is of paramount importance in understanding the laws of NIAC that apply to him or her. For the next two hours, issues related to the status of actors in NIAC will be explored by this distinguished panel. The construct of this panel is rather straightforward. Professor Michael Schmidt, the Chair of Public International Law at Durham University Law School in Great Britain, oh, excuse me, the UK, <laughs> will discuss the status of anyone shooting at the government during a NIAC. Professor Sean Watts, Assistant Professor of Law at Creighton University Law School, will discuss the status of anyone shooting on behalf of the government during a NIAC. And Stephen Popper, Assistant Legal Advisor for Political Military Affairs in the Department of State's Office of Legal Advisor, will discuss his sense of where there seems to be emerging consensus between the U.S. government and its allies on the issue of belligerent status in NIAC, and also where there remains a range of views. So without further ado, Professor Schmidt, you have the floor. Can you put up the first set of slides, slides, please? There you go. Thanks. Okay, I'm uh, Mike Schmidt uh, from Durham University Law School. That's not Durham, North Carolina. It's the other Durham. It's in the United Kingdom or Great Britain or England. For those of you who don't know where that is, it's a tiny island lying off the coast of France. What Andy has, I, I'm leaving so I can say these sorts of things now. What Andy has asked me to talk about today is the subject of opposition forces in NIACs. I have to tell you I don't entirely agree with the folks this morning who seem to suggest that the Supreme Court doesn't know what they're talking about and Harold Coe doesn't know what he's talking about, but we'll clear that up tomorrow when he comes to speak to us. And that there's not much law. I kind of take the other view. I believe that there is law on NIAC. We can some extent, although it's difficult, reliably determine what conflicts are in terms of classification of conflicts, and that the law that is uh, resident in NIAC is not that difficult to discern. So what I'll be focusing on today is the classification of those forces that are in opposition to the government. Now, it is true that there's not a great deal of law on the subject of parties to a NIAC. That's correct, and that was mentioned this morning. However, there is some guidance. For example, the Common Article 3, Common Article 3 to the four Geneva Conventions, talks about persons who are taking no active part in hostilities. And then it goes on to say, including members of the armed forces who are hors de combat. So there's your first data point, which we'll need to remember. Then if we move to additional protocol two, which is of course only binding on state's party, except to the extent that it reflects customary international law, we have a bit more help in article one, which deals with the material field of application. It specifically says that we're talking about conflicts between 
a government's armed forces and, and here's the critical point for my presentation, dissident armed forces or other organized armed groups. And then it goes on to describe certain characteristics of the organized armed group that are relevant in the additional protocol to context. Additionally, and a point that's very important later on in the presentation, additionally, Article 13.3 uh, specifically mentions civilians and says that civilians enjoy the protection of that part of the protocol, and that's the part that provides civilian protections, unless they take a direct part in hostilities. And so again, we need to remember that. Now, what that leads us to, the con it leads us to is the conclusion that there are basically two types of folks in ANIAC. There are civilians and there are organized armed groups. And so here's what the classification of individuals in a NIAC looks like. You have civilians and you have civilians who do not participate and you have civilians who do participate. All of the others are members of organized armed groups. There are three types of organized armed groups. You have the state's armed forces. You have dissident armed forces, a topic of mine my presentation, Sean, will talk about the first category. And then you have other organized armed groups, in other words, armed groups that are not dissident armed forces. And what are the consequences of this distinction? The consequences primarily bear on the principle of distinction, which is about targeting. And the rules are really simple. Anyone who opposes the government militarily can be attacked. Those folks don't count in the proportionality calculation. And those folks don't count when you do your precautions and attack analysis. How do we know this? We know this because if we look at the law of non-international armed conflict, it tells us that we cannot attack civilians, we can't attack those who are hors de combat, and we can't attack other individuals such as religious personnel and military, should say medical, medical personnel, and to attack those individuals is a law act violation. So to attack other individuals is not unless they are civilians directly and participating, and that's where the other point comes in. So we know these are the consequences of classification in a non-international armed conflict. There are consequences with regard to detention. That is the subject of a separate panel. I won't be talking about that. Let's start with individuals who are not members of the opposition forces. And here we're primarily talking about individual criminals and criminal gangs, criminal gangs that are armed. Now generally these uh, individuals cannot be parties to the conflict, and this is true whether or not they're fighting the state on their own, or they're merely taking advantage of the instability that's resident in armed conflict to engage in criminal activities. In other words, you have an ongoing NIAC, and they're active in that space. Why do we draw this conclusion? We draw it because we look at the commentary to the Pictet commentary to Common Article 3 that tells us that Common Article 3 was intentionally not meant to cover bandits or brigands, uh, minor rebellions, and so forth. Why? Because of a risk that ordinary criminals would begin to treat themselves as organized so that they would benefit from the law of armed conflict and thus at least be able to make the argument that their actions weren't criminal actions but were privileged actions. And so they were traditionally, or they were traditionally written out of the picture. Now that's the traditional conclusion. And the traditional conclusion, in my view, is that the purpose of the violence that an organized armed group is engaging in, whatever type of organized armed group, must be to attain political control and authority. And what that means is that operations against them are governed by domestic and human rights law. However, if they operate on behalf of a party to the conflict, then they become themselves an organized armed group or, or an individual who is directly participating in hostilities, the next two categories we deal with. And there's a good example. An example would be a situation where a party to a NIAC says to the criminal group, look, we'll give you free reign. Do what you want in terms of your criminal activity, but there's a quid pro quo. And the quid pro quo is that you have to assist us, for example, by attacking them if they enter this space, by providing logistic support, by guarding our convoys and our facilities. If a criminal gang does this, then they are acting on behalf of a party to the conflict, and they are themselves either a separate organized armed group or alternatively part and parcel of the organized armed group for which they are acting. 
On the other hand, not all relationship drives you into the organized armed group camp. For example, in Afghanistan, it is common for uh, drug lords to have to pay taxes to the Taliban. This fact and this fact alone does not mean that they then become either an individual organized armed group or part of the Taliban such that they may be attacked. Remember the consequence. If you get, to, if you get here, you're subject to attack, at least while you directly participate. What's the key? The key is whether or not group activities, the group activities, are at the level of direct participation. And we'll talk about that level in a moment. Now, some folks uh, should by now be concerned because they want to call criminal groups armed groups, organized armed groups for the purpose of NIAC. I had lunch with uh, Knut Dorman, and we were talking about this. I do believe that there is a possible change in the wind because you have situations like Mexico. We talked about Mexico both. Uh, talked about Mexico versus Colombia. It was a very important point this morning. You have situations where, like Mexico where the violence is at a very high level. And something that wasn't mentioned this morning was the criterion of intensity. And here you have violence that dramatically exceeds the minimum threshold of intensity for a NIAC. Thousands of civilians are killed. The state has to resort to the military because in many cases, they are outgunned. And so I think there is room for expanding over time through state practice with a combination of Opinia Juris, expanding the concept of organized armed groups and NIAC a bit into organized criminal activity. I would note that the black letter law doesn't actually mention a political motive. That's something I derived from looking at the commentary. And, sir? Either that or they could come closer <laughs> from the next. I, I feel like I'm on the Eurovision contest. OK, and so what that takes us to is taking us to a situation where we may see this law begin to evolve. And I would anticipate that the first point of evolution is to distinguish a criminal armed group that merely takes advantage of a situation of instability from a criminal armed group that is competing with the state for authority and control over a particular territory so that that criminal group can actually engage unfettered in its criminal activities. And I would expect the latter to be the, if we see movement, it's going to be towards that group first and towards the, the former group later. Let's talk about the three groups. The first is dissident armed forces. Dissident armed forces are relatively similar or relatively clear. Listen, Common Article 3 talks about armed forces. And Common Article 3 talks about the obligations that are imposed on each party to the conflict. And what this automatically means is that there are armed forces on both sides. Sean will talk about the state's armed forces. I'll talk about dissident armed forces. And of course, an additional protocol too, dissident armed forces are expressly mentioned and they are distinguished from other organized armed groups. Clearly, these folks are targetable. And clearly, they're targetable at all times. How do we know this? We know it because Common Article 3 provides protection to members of the armed forces who are hors de combat. So if you're not hors de combat and you're a member of the armed forces, you're targetable all the time. That's relatively simple. Who qualifies? Obviously, members of the regular armed forces that have broken away and are now fighting the state. Rebel armed forces. I would also extend this to militia and volunteer groups that are part of the armed forces that have broken away. Because in uh, GC3 Article 4, they are included in the concept of armed forces, so there's no logical reason not to extend this to NIAC. But the problem comes with regard to paramilitary and armed law enforcement agencies. And the reason there's a problem is that in IAC, there's an incorporation requirement. They have to be incorporated into the armed forces to be combatant in IAC. But that logic doesn't hold in an IAC. Because in a NIAC, the very purpose of the forces is to combat criminality, and NIAC is criminality. So there's no need to make them like the armed forces. They're performing their normal duties. And I believe this is uh, supported by the commentary to Additional Protocol 1, which specifically says when we're using the term armed forces here, we're not talking about armed forces as that term is a, uh, 
understood in domestic legislation. We're talking about it in its broad context. We include customs, we include armed police forces, and so forth. Now, there is a condition on that status for these groups that break away, police forces that break away, dissident forces that break away. Most of you are familiar with the interpretive guidance on the notion of direct participation in hostilities, the result of a five-year ICRC study uh, that a number of us participated in. There are probably five or six folks in the audience that were part of this study. It, en it didn't end as well as it could have, but nevertheless, there's lots of valuable stuff in this document. And one of the valuable things is, is where the interpretive guidance says that a breakaway unit, they don't, they don't become civilians merely because they're fighting the government. They're not civilians, but they have to remain organized into the units. In other words, if you break away as a company, then you gotta stay a company. And if you don't stay a company, then you become, and, but you fight the government, then you become a member of an organized armed group that you've joined, another organized armed group, or you're an individual directly participating in hostilities. So the one condition on breaking away is the condition that you stay in your unit. You're identifiable as a unit that has now moved to the other side. That brings us to other organized armed groups mentioned by the additional protocol. Now, it was previously unclear whether this, these individuals uh, were civilians or whether they were some kind of category that was analogous to a dissident armed force. The ICRC uh, Interpretive Guidance Project took this issue on, and early on, uh, in some of the very first meetings, we talked about the possibility that they are, in fact, civilians, but they're continuously participating, so they're targetable throughout. However, the ICRC pushed back on that, in my mind, correctly, because they said that creates a situation where you've got the military on one side, and on the other side, everyone's a civilian. That's not, a, that's not an optimal situation. That's an approach that has, by the way, been adopted by US courts. And instead, the group and the guidance adopts a binary approach. There are civilians and members of organized armed groups, which includes dissident armed forces. And the DPH rule, the direct participation hostilities rule, does not apply to them. And that's important, because that means they're targetable all the time, not just for such time as they are, they are participating. And what that leaves us with is a definition that tells us that a, or an other organized armed group is a group that's not a dissident armed group or dissident armed force, but is organized and armed. And therefore, we need to ask, what does organized and what does armed mean? Well, the commentary to additional protocol two, this is wrong, it says one. The commentary to additional protocol two says we're not talking about military org organization, classic military organization. All that you basically need is organization that's capable of planning and carrying out military operations and imposing some discipline. Sorry. Would you like me to hold it in my arms? All right. Now, that particular, that particular standard has been the subject of great interpretation in the jurisprudence in particular of the ICTY. There are lots and lots and lots of cases on organization in the ICTY, Milosevic, Limaz, Tadic, of course, which was mentioned this morning. But a case that's a nice case to know about is Haradinaj, because Haradinaj actually goes back through all the prior jurisprudence and says, let's take a look at the KLA and the Croatians and so forth. And they came up with these as indicative factors, not dispositive factors. Uh, headquarters, control of territory, we were talking about that this morning, control of territory. Do they recruit, do they train, and so forth. But, but, those criteria, are, or that determination is made on a case-by-case -case basis. I think what is common to all the criteria is that there must be, for these other organized armed groups, there must be some structure. Doesn't mean that it has to be military, it can be decentralized, it can be a flat structure. Ken has done some writing where he talks about this in the NYU journal. It can be flat, it can be decentralized. It does, you don't have to wear uniforms, you don't have to have ranks, you don't have to have bases, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, but you gotta have some structure. And then you have to act in a coordinated fashion somehow. For example, you share intelligence, you plan your operations, you deconflict your operations, you have a means of communicating among the various components of the group. So what you need is some structure and some coordination. By the way, 
there's no such thing as a levy on mass in a NIAC. And the reason is, by definition, a levy on mass is where the population rises up to meet invaders. By definition, they're neither organized nor do they coordinate their activities. They spontaneously arise. Now, with regard to organization, there are two challenging cases. Uh, after this morning's panel, I hate to bring up transnational terrorism again. So let's assume for the sake of argument, just for the sake of argument or analysis, that transnational terrorists that, are, are, that engage in activities are engaged in a NIAC, just for the sake of analysis. We need, if that is in fact the case, and we need to be very careful about the organization criterion, because merely sharing an ideology does not an organized armed group make. And the mere fact that one group or of individuals is inspired by a terrorist group to engage in its own violence does not make them part of the organization. There actually has to be organization structure. So if we take Al-Qaeda, it seems to me there's absolutely no question that that is an organized armed group that consists of lots of nodes that talk to each other, that engage in operations together and so forth. But that doesn't make every single transnational terrorist who is, uh, is anti-American, for example, wants to conduct attacks against the United States and Great Britain and Spain, doesn't make every one of those groups or every one of those individuals a member of Al-Qaeda. So we need to focus. If we're looking at a group like Al-Qaeda, you need to focus on the law. You need to look for the structural relationship between the group that you're exploring. And the other problem, or the other challenge, has to do with virtual groups, because as many of you know, today you can organize online. I guess uh, Representative Wiener was organizing online, so we're learning that this is pervasive. And you may not even know the name of the other person. You may never meet him or her. Clearly, if that group is operating autonomously, it's not an organized armed group. The classic case is Estonia, cyber attacks against Estonia. The Estonians moved the statue from the center of Tallinn to a cemetery. It was a World War II statue. The ethnic Russians went crazy over this, and suddenly autonomous cyber attacks were coming from ethnic Russians, and then Russians uh, all over the world were attacking Estonia. That's operating autonomously. It's clearly not organization. But what if you operate collectively? That's the case not of Estonia. That's the case of Georgia. Because, and I understand it's an IAC, but let, for the sake of illustration, let's use that as an example. In the very first hours of the conflict in Georgia, a website came up that contained a list of targets and contained hacker tools. And everyone started, all of the Russians started going to that website to download the target and the tools necessary to attack that target. They were acting collectively. But in my mind, they're not acting cooperatively, so they're not an organized armed group. But it's clearly possible to imagine an organized, or an online group, a virtual group, that has organization and leadership. They, they operate together. They share targets, share tools, deconflict their operations, share intelligence, and so forth. The only problem is the requirement, or the seeming requirement, of whether or not organization that sort of organization allows for LOAC enforcement. And we have a group, a NATO-type group, that is looking into this subject. Can't come up with the answer yet. Don't have an answer on that one yet. OK. That's the organization criteria. Remember, it's an organized armed group. So what we're looking at now is the armed criteria. In my view, an armed group is clearly a group that carries out attacks. And I mean attacks as that term is used in the law of armed conflict. Attacks has defined in Article 49 of Additional Protocol 1, acts of violence, whether in offense or defense, those sorts of attacks. If your group does that, then your group is armed. I would also suggest that if your group otherwise directly participates in hostilities, then the group is armed as well. So you may have a group an organized group that doesn't itself carry out attacks, but it's, for example, providing the tactical intelligence that's necessary to carry out those attacks. And in my mind, in my mind, that particular group would be armed. There is a potential issue, and the potential issue has to do with cyber operations. Again, in my view, for a, 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 a group that's engaged in cyber operations to be armed, the cyber operations have to rise to the level of an attack,
has that term is understood in the law of armed conflict, that how it applies to cyber, or direct participation. The attack piece is actually the harder piece because we have to ask what, ask what is an attack. There is a long-standing uh, discussion on this particular issue. My per personal view is that an attack is something that kills or injures people or damages or destroys things. Uh, there are other views, some of them represented in this, in this room. We don't need to revisit that now. The point that is made is that it must be an attack or otherwise be direct participation that the uh, group is engaging in before the group can qualify as an organized armed group. Now, certain issues now that we've looked at organized and armed, just two issues with regard to organized armed groups themselves. The first is, what do you do with a group that's both armed and non-armed? It has an armed wing, and it has a political wing, or it has a social wing. Well, I, I believe that if those wings are clearly distinct, clearly distinct, where they, you can have no confusion, where there's no melding together of the roles, then only the armed wing can constitute an organized armed group. However, if you have a group where these functions are melded together, he's a political, he's a social, and I'm a fighter, but they're all in the same group and it kind of is mixed up, it's not clear, then I believe that that group is an organized armed group because it has, in part, as a central role, engaging in hostilities. Now, this raises a more complex and more controversial subject, and that's the continuous combat function role. In the interpretive guidance, it says basically, and I'm paraphrasing and probably not doing it justice, but it basically says that only individuals who have a continuous combat function can be members of a group. What is a continuous combat function? A continuous combat function is a role in the group that if it was, if it was engaged in by an individual, would amount to direct participation. So your role in the group is basically direct participation in hostilities. However, unlike the civilian, if you're in the group, now that you qualified to be a member of the group by virtue of CCF, you're targetable at all the time, all the time. What's the justification? The justification has to do with distinguishing from the civilian population and a lack of a formalized uh, membership system. And so uh, the CCF represents a functional approach. This has been criticized. Uh, uh, General Watkin criticized it uh, a good deal. Uh, this morning, this continu continuous combat function, and I share every thought that he had on this. It strikes me, it strikes me, I know there's a big controversy that this is counterfactual and counter-normative. It's counterfactual because on the battlefield on a NIAC, you often do know who the other side is. They wear uniforms, or maybe they're at, they have a remote base, and the only one that's at the base is going to be a member of the organized armed group. And it's counter-normative because if that's not the case, if you can't distinguish and you, and you actually harbor doubt, such that would cause a reasonable warfighter to hesitate, you're required by law to treat them as civilians. So there's no reason to have the continuous combat function rule. And what, and I, again, I agree with General Watkin when he noted this morning that it seems to turn the Yusad Bellum principle of just authority on its head. I, I agree absolutely. This results in an imbalance between the government's forces, who after all have a right to participate in the hostilities, if you will, and the insurgents, who after all are engaging in criminal activity, and they get a better deal. Because if you wear a uniform, if you're in the military of the government, you wear a uniform, you're targetable all the time under international law. However, if you're an insurgent, you have to have a continuous combat function. Let me turn to my last category, civilians who directly participate in hostilities. And we're talking about individuals here who are not members of the dissident armed forces or members of other organized armed groups. These are individuals, as the, the interpretive guidance says, individuals who act on a spontaneous basis, they quickly rise up, who act on a sporadic basis, who are otherwise unorganized. And a good example would be the situation of an individual who's paid to implant an IED. They don't implant the IED because they're a member of an organized armed group. They do it because they can get $300 to do that, and they need, and they need the money. This is a civilian who is directly participating in hostilities. Or uh, you're seeing this in the Middle East now, an ad hoc or, uh, uh, uprising of people. If the people just get together and they're mad and they, uh, and they want to go attack a police station or a military base, these individuals are civilians who are directly participating. 
There are two key issues with regard to direct participation. One is what is direct participation? And the second is when does direct participation occur? We have been over the direct participation ground 8,000 times at 9,000 different conferences. It's horrible, I can't do it anymore, so let me very briefly talk about it, as it, as it affects this particular subject. There, there, in the interpretive guidance, with regard to what is direct participation, the ICRC suggests there are three elements. I know everyone in the room doesn't agree, uh, particularly people sitting close to the front that are tall and come from another country, uh, but, but I generally find these three rule, these three constituent elements, or constitutive elements, to be generally acceptable, although I quibble over the specific application. For example, with regard to the first rule, I have a problem with saying, and I think Panina has raised this at a number of conferences, I have a problem with saying it's just hurting the enemy. No, it's also helping yourself. I agree with Panina. This can be fixed. Uh, also, I don't agree with examples of causation that are cited in the direct participation guidance uh, of, of, of what is not direct participation, assembling IEDs and voluntary human shielding. This doesn't make any sense. If you're giving advice to your war fighting commander in Iraq or Afghanistan or wherever, Libya, wherever, and you tell the boss that I know that guy is only assembling IEDs, but trust me, he's not a target. I mean, this is the last legal advice you give as his staff judge advocate. So, but again, these are quibbling over application of the three rules, which are you gotta hurt the enemy, there's gotta be a causal link between the act and that harm to the enemy, and there has to be a belligerent nexus. In other words, it's about the fight. I think where the greater problem lies is the when question. The interpretive guidance says that we're talking about a period where you're engaged in measures preparatory to an act and then deployment to and from the act, basically, I'm paraphrasing. Certainly all of those times are, are, in, are, are included, but I think there are two criticisms. I think they're both fair. The first is that that window is too narrow. Uh, Jorn Dinstein has written on this particular subject. I like the way he explains it. The way he explains it with regard to the window is it's upstream and downstream as far as there's a causal connection. That makes sense to me. It's about the act. And then the second problem is it creates a revolving door, a revolving door because a person is targetable when they're directly participating, deploying to and from, and then they're, when they get home, they can't be attacked, then they are targetable when they go out again, then they can't be attacked if they make it home and so forth. Hence the revolving door of targetability. Uh, the interpretive guidance says that's not a malfunction of the law of armed conflict. Critics uh, point out, I think correctly so, that it, it, and it's particularly relevant in NIAC, in an insurgency, secrecy is often the key. So you may not know when an attack is going to occur, when, where an attack is going to occur, but you may get intelligence as to where that individual is that was involved in the attack. It doesn't make sense to me to not be able to go after that, intel uh, that individual when you have actionable intelligence. Again, I think, uh, again, this is my view, I think there's an imbalance between the government forces and the insurgents, and, it, and again, it, as Ken said, it turns, it, it turns the law on its head. It, so what's the preferred rule? My preferred rule is, listen, if you join an organized armed group, and the purpose of that group is to engage in violence against the state, and then you're a member of that organized armed group and you're targetable for such period as you're a member of the group. Uh, with regard to uh, individuals, if you're an individual and you engage in recurring acts of violence against the state, then it creates a, not a continuous, but a period during which you are subject to attack. So what are the final conclusions? The final conclusions are, there is a distinction with regard to dissident armed forces and other organized armed groups, but I don't believe I don't believe there's really a distinction with regard to consequences. I believe you can group them together. You have to take a little different course to get to the point where you find that they're an other organized armed group or a dissident armed force. It's a little different path, but when you get to the end of your journey, the same law is going to apply. And of course, this requires me to uh, reject the continuous combat function. Then with regard to the civilians directly participating again, I generally, I find generally not entirely acceptable the constitutive elements, although we need to be really, really careful how we apply them, and I think the interpretive guidance makes a mistake in applying uh, them to certain cases, and the revolving door, 
in my view, the revolving door is a forget it situation. That's not the law. It can't possibly be the law because it doesn't sensibly balance military necessity and humanitarian considerations and all of, all of the law of armed conflict, whether international or non-international, is about achieving an appropriate balance. Thanks. Thank you, Professor Smith. Next up will be Professor Sean Watt, who will discuss the status of anyone shooting on behalf of the government during a non-international armed conflict. All right, well, uh, good afternoon. And uh, I'd like to thank uh, the War College for the really generous uh, invitation, considering uh, especially that I was a no-show last year. Uh, I was literally rained out uh, from the last year's presentation and very grateful to have been made a part of, uh, of this year's event as well. I've followed these events for years, uh, primarily through the Boo Book series, but uh, also now by streaming them online. Uh, I, I indeed feel uh, very grateful to be part of this. Uh, as uh, Mike alluded and as uh, Commander Norris explained, uh, my assignment for this afternoon was to discuss the status of government forces uh, in non-international armed conflict. Uh, I'll confess that honestly my first thought when I got assigned that topic was great. I'm going to give the shortest presentation in the history of uh, the, the Naval Legal Conference here uh, because at, at first reflection uh, to my admittedly formalist uh, eyes, uh, I did not see a lot there. Uh, in terms of international law. But honestly, after reflection uh, and after a bit of research, I, I think I have come, uh, and increasingly after this morning's presentations, I think I have come to appreciate some of the complexities uh, in this area. And I would concur that if this has historically been a relatively simple task to explain the status of government forces in NIAC, it, it may no longer be so. And I think that's for two reasons. Uh, as was noted in, I believe, the comments uh, following this morning's presentation, uh, the law of NIAC is, is just evolving. It's different. Uh, and NIAC itself is different. Uh, Non-international armed conflicts simply aren't what they used to be. Uh, they've become much more complex, not only in their geographical scope, but in terms of the scope of persons that participate in them. I, I mean that by describing the rebel force, but also governments as well. It, it's clear now uh, that states' responses to NIAC are increasingly interagency efforts, and so the temptation to bring a different cast of characters uh, to these conflicts I think is great and may complicate questions of government forces' status. Uh, and so the second, I think, challenge or, or the second uh, complexity, I think, is, is also that the way we read the law of NIAC is uh, undoubtedly changing. That if one looks at uh, commentary or contemporaneous uh, statements made by states when they wrote additional protocol two, or even when they wrote uh, common article three, uh, many of those views simply don't hold any anymore. States have either abandoned them or uh, other legal authorities have called those views into question. So for those reasons, uh, I have begun to anticipate a bit more complexity in this area than I might originally have, have admitted. Uh, my outline is, is simply to propose a few questions uh, and then to answer them myself, and, and perhaps uh, that will provoke responses in the question and answer period afterward as well. Uh, I've organized them so the easier ones are up front and the harder ones are at the end. Uh, here I'm just hoping that I run out of time uh, and, and that I don't have to answer the harder ones. I'll, I'll confess that trick uh, right off the bat. Um, my first question will have to do with describing the law. Uh, my second will be to ask perhaps why that state of the law is the way it is and, and perhaps to explain some of its resilience, uh, why it has stayed the way it has for so long. Uh, after that, I'd, I'd like to explore some of the pressures uh, that are on, uh, operating on the law of NIAC at this point. And then finally, maybe some, uh, some predictions uh, about the future of this law. Um, before I launch into that first uh, descriptive effort, uh, I meant to clarify what I mean by status, and, and Mike's done a great job of, of setting this up. I, I intend to discuss status much in the same way that Mike did. Uh, we're all familiar uh, with uh, the use of status by the international law of armed conflict uh, that, apl that, that applies to international armed conflicts. It makes frequent use of, of status and doles out status uh, in some cases quite in, in quite a stingy way. Um, NIAC, uh, perha perhaps not quite so, um, but I do mean to, to discuss status not in terms of uh, persons hors de combat, protected persons or prisoners of war, but rather in 
terms of, of what might classically be called combatant status uh, under the international law of armed conflict. And so there I'm concerned chiefly, uh, the consequences of course uh, of combatant status are one's exposure to hostilities, the circumstances under which this person may be deliberately exposed to hostilities, uh, but also that person's uh, authority to himself or herself uh, engage directly uh, in hostilities. Uh, so now this first question, uh, does the international law of non-international armed conflict uh, speak to the status of government agents uh, in those conflicts? I, I think the traditional and formalist uh, international law response is a fairly confident no, uh, that it simply doesn't, that states have not, this is not an area of the law that states have explicitly conceded to the international uh, legal system. Status remains uh, in NIAC, I, I think particularly government status, uh, one of the remaining voids uh, of international law. And as the early presentations revealed, and particularly as the question ses session revealed, there, is varying, there are varying levels of comfort and discomfort with voids in international law. Some of us as international lawyers encounter voids and feel compelled to fill those voids. To, if, if we s detect a void in international law, well, we're just not looking hard enough. Uh, l let's look elsewhere, look, let's look harder, let's look at more state practice, let's, let's consult more, uh, more scholarly treatises, and I bet we can find the international law that applies. Others, and I count myself in, in this group, encounter these voids and say, well, it's a void. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just that states have concluded that they will not commit this issue to the international uh, legal system. Uh, that, so admitting my, my sort of formalist or traditionalist approach to these questions, I, I, I would characterize uh, that first answer as, well, there's just a void. Uh, where's my proof of this void? Uh, to, I'm not sure how I prove a void, but um, I, I would say start first with the positive law. There, there's really no direct treatment in, in treaty law of the status of government forces uh, in non-international armed conflicts. Uh, nor is there a lot of custom. It's not widely addressed in, in military manuals uh, of various states, or particularly states that might be specially affected uh, in these circumstances. Uh, I don't need to belabor, belabor I think, the non-international uh, armed conflict law on point, for instance, Common Article 3, but I would mention that I, I think it's important and indicative that that last paragraph or that last clause of Common Article 3, that basically this reservation clause that says, by the way, none of these humanitarian protections that we've just agreed to mean anything in terms of status for rebel forces, uh, Pictet's commentary adds that, uh, that there was, was no chance of Common Article 3 ever uh, being accepted by states without that clause. A more subtle uh, distinction in the positive law that I, I found in preparing for this panel uh, was in the appearance of the De Martins Clause. Uh, an author named uh, Emily Crawford, who wrote a, an interesting book recently on uh, status in non-international armed conflict, points out that there's actually a difference in the way that the De Martins Clause appears uh, in Additional Protocol 1 and the way that it appears in Additional Protocol 2. In Additional Protocol 1, it, it refers to international law, it refers to international custom and the law of nations. But the law of nations part may be with the, the Geneva Convention iteration, the 1949 Convention iteration of the De Martins Clause. But those terms are, are absent uh, in Additional Protocol 2, and, and I did not check her work on the diplomatic record, but uh, Professor Crawford uh, asserts that that was deliberate, that states did not want international law to have a say, even uh, through the, uh, the humanitarian mechanism of the, uh, of the De Martins Clause. Uh, and so I would, you know, I would add that to my, to my stack of evidence that says, look, this is just not something that states have wanted to commit generally, this question of status uh, to international law. Uh, I was unable to locate any prosecutions uh, of government forces for having participated. Again, uh, their mere participation uh, being prosecuted on an international basis, I, I'm sure and would be willing to concede that there may be domestic prosecutions uh, on this count, uh, but international tribunals or tribunals applying strictly international legal standards do not seem to have concerned themselves with the fact of mere participation of particular government uh, forces. And then finally, in the academic commentary, one finds very, very little in the way of, of discussion of the status of government forces under international law. Uh, what you do find is, is, seems most often to be dicta. Uh, so you'll find a scholar who is fleshing out the admittedly unsettled uh, nature of combatant status in international armed conflict, 
but most of them will, will tend to include this aside that says, which by the way has nothing to do or has no role in non-international armed conflict. Some will go so far as to say that the status is simply irrelevant uh, in non-international armed conflict. Uh, so uh, with that, again, admittedly formalist uh, outlook on the question of whether uh, there is treatment of government status in the international law of non-international armed conflict, I'll, I'll move on to the second question, which is uh, why. Why is it that, that states haven't committed this issue more clearly uh, to international law? Uh, a couple possibilities occur. Uh, the first is that there simply hasn't been any need, uh, that states, were, uh, because they regard this, this issue to have been committed exclusively to their domestic legal systems, simply haven't looked to international law and haven't sought to develop it there uh, for that reason. Um, I, I think this is uh, further evidence of this explanation comes from the fact that, you know, even if you do, even if you are one of these, these lawyers who would say, well, no, there, there's got to be some international law there. If you look at enough state practice or if you look at enough uh, cases, states must think that they owe international law some duties with respect to, to whom they place on the battlefield. Well, there may have been no need because maybe if that's your outlook on this, most states, as, as Professor Henkin might have said, most states most of the time are probably complying with it. That, that if you have this outlook that says, no, you have to send armed forces uh, when you go out and participate in a non-international armed conflict, well, you know, most states are probably doing that anyway. It, it makes tactical sense, I'm sure, and it makes sense to states for a lot of other uh, reasons. Uh, so he, he, that may explain also why we find this uh, to be a void. The second reason that I think uh, there's a void, or, or my explanation for why, is got to, has got to be a byproduct of states' general reluctance uh, to commit issues of non-international armed conflict to international law. We've all got the same books on our shelves, I suspect, and were we to stack them up or, or, or break them up to, to, to reflect the portion that is applicable to international armed conflict, it would be vast uh, in comparison to the portion uh, that is applicable in non-international armed conflict. Uh, states have consistently declined invitations to um, draw parity uh, between these two bodies uh, of law. And the reasons are, are well known to all of us, I, I, I'm sure. The, the fear of conferring, conferring legitimacy uh, on rebel groups, and, and I think most, most obviously the fear of lim limiting operational flexibility and, and, and freedom of action. Uh, so I, I would take that to be a second uh, explanation of why of uh, this law may be underdeveloped to some eyes. Uh, the final reason is, is, I think, one that has attended efforts to develop non-international armed conflict for a long time as well, and that is lack of consensus. That even if states were committed uh, to developing this in the international legal fora, uh, that they would find, uh, they'd have a difficult time agreeing on how exactly to draw this up. Uh, the majority of you uh, at diplomatic conferences has been uh, at times to expand uh, the law applicable to non-international armed conflict, uh, frankly at times even to contract it. I would include uh, additional protocol too as in some ways an effort to contract uh, the application of international law to non-international armed conflicts. Uh, this is particularly so uh, with regard to status. You know, even if you look at that body of law, international applicable to international armed conflict, I think you find that status is treated in a very incomplete fashion. Uh, looking at uh, additional Protocol 1, Article 43, and its effort, uh, it's 43 sub 2, I believe, and, and its effort to speak to status, one still finds a, a relatively incomplete picture, and its implementation and the implementation of Article 44 that draws on Article 43 is incomplete as well. So, you know, if states have had that great difficulty uh, coming to agreement on what status, particularly combatant status, actually means in international armed conflict, uh, I'm pessimistic about their ability to do so in non-international armed conflicts. Uh, so what, what does the future look like? Uh, what challenges does this, uh, this picture I've painted of the law face today? Well, I'd say first uh, that uh, as I said in my opening, that the first challenge is that non-international armed conflict is changing. Uh, if it was once limited to this, this bifurcated view that there is civil war and there is international armed conflict and, and the, the positive law wouldn't recognize too much in between the two, uh, I think first that's a, an oversimplification. Uh, I did have a chance to look at some of the pre-1949 law on non-international armed conflict and, and you actually find something that looks more like the spectrum uh, 
that was painted this morning, or I, I think it was Professor Garraway that referred to a, a rainbow spectrum of various types of non-international armed conflict. They'd, they'd actually heard of this, I think, before 1949. There's reference to, uh, in some writings by Lauterpacht, to, a, uh, to a, a case of rebellion, insurgency, or belligerency, and that these, these were distinct concepts, and they were a menu of choices that a state might use to describe the situation that it was facing uh, internally. Uh, and, and so I think if that spectrum uh, existed before 1949, I think it, is, it very much exists today. Uh, on that spectrum, uh, I would say that if this notion of government forces status in NIAC is underdeveloped, a place where it might be further developed, are, in, are not in these non-international armed conflicts that are barely armed conflict, the, these, no, these situations that barely clear the hurdles that Mike spelled out so clearly for us earlier, but rather in these cases that, that we find difficult to distinguish from international armed conflict, these internationalized non-international armed conflict. There, there may be some creep uh, from the international armed conflict law uh, into these situations. Uh, two recent examples, uh, I think, show how uh, states that cling to you know, my traditional outlook on government status um, may be challenged. Uh, I, I would think of the operation against bin Laden. Uh, it was striking to me how quickly non-legal commentators seized on the identities and the function and the, they weren't using this word, but the status of some of the people that were alleged to have participated in this operation. Uh, you know, law that is entirely out of line with expectations uh, tends not to weather uh, very well or, or survive long. And so I, I suspect that these very, these, even these popular uh, media-driven concerns about who participates in these operations may put pressure on traditional notions uh, of this question that I'm addressing. The second pressure, I, I think, comes from new types of armed conflict. Uh, I'm thinking here of computer network uh, operations. What little uh, is known publicly about how states staff their cyber war forces uh, suggests that it may not just be uh, armed forces and, and uniform members that are participating in these uh, activities. The you know, sort of the urban myth that, that permeates the, the, the cyber law community is this situation where you've got a computer virus all set to go. It was designed by you know, maybe a guy from MIT who's on contract to the National Security Agency and, and maybe a Title 50 guy was in there helping us do some of the reconnaissance. And when all the work is done, you know, they say, hey, you, uh, with the name tag on your shirt, and, and, you know, come on over here and hit send on this computer for us, would you? Uh, you know, Look, that, that's got to be the height of meaningless, empty legal formalism, but it, it must betray some attitudes, right? If that indeed is happening, or if people are telling this, this urban myth over and over again, that maybe there's something behind it. Maybe there are expectations that it is only members of the armed forces that can do this stuff, uh, even in a NIAC. So I would concede uh, some pressure there uh, as well. The, the last pressure I, I guess I would admit to uh, is that of visibility, that these armed conflicts are, are, are simply much more visible than they were in the past and certainly more visible than uh, at the time that, uh, the time when the positive law that bears on those conflicts was drafted. Social media, uh, social networking uh, have all made uh, or have all shined a brighter spotlight on what states are doing in these non-international armed conflicts and surely that will also uh, bring to bear some pressure. Uh, so last, what does the future look like? Um, I, I will, I, I had planned to talk a little bit and walk through some of the positive law, but I, I think Mike did a great job uh, on that. And much of what Mike said could be translated over to a rule that, uh, that, that, that developed that would purport to limit the participation of some persons in government's uh, non-international armed conflict operations. Uh, but let me come at it from a different angle as, as well. Rather than analogize to international armed conflict rules, what one might do is work within the existing NIAC uh, to conclude some rules about government participation and government status in NIAC. The most obvious place to do that for me, so, so if I were to abandon my formalist, you know, sort of sovereigntist outlook on this stuff and say, hey, I really think there ought to be a rule, how do I get a rule to operate here? It, to me, it most clearly comes from the principle of distinction. Uh, you know, you can, uh, you can get north-south nodding from just about anyone on, on the, the operation of the principle of distinction in non-international armed conflict. You don't need to look outside 
uh, the borders of that positive law to find it. And maybe that's where we find some regulation of government participation, that, that the principle of distinction isn't just about uh, who one targets, but it's also about the face that one presents to an enemy. Uh, that the principle of distinction includes not only a duty to limit the effects of what one does to military objects uh, and to combatants, but that also it speaks to the, to the face that you put on the battlefield, that one's participants in armed conflict must look like combatants. They must present themselves as, as targetable in order to reinforce the principle of distinction, that the principle of, of distinction becomes very difficult to honor uh, when forces don't present themselves as, com as combatants on the battlefield. So what you might do is reverse engineer uh, a rule that says, well, states are in fact limited uh, in terms of who they re may respond uh, or who may respond to challenges of international or, or of non-international armed conflict. And that, look, only armed forces can really satisfy uh, the principle of distinctions requirement that one com one's combatants look and act uh, like combatants. I think this meshes also nicely with uh, another normative force behind developing more rules in non-international armed conflict, and that's this, this notion of moral equivalence. Uh, there are a number of scholarly writings now that say, look, uh, whatever you say about the positive law or whatever states seem to be doing at this moment, there is a moral disconnect uh, between a set of rules that regards persons differently based on the character of the conflict. That to say that a civilian ought to benefit from the the principle of distinction in international armed conflict and that she shouldn't benefit from it in non-international armed co conflict is really morally absurd. Um, so, you know, those that are given toward that type of argument, I, I think, might conclude that. And, and, and Ms. Crawford's book and a number of other in, uh, recent articles on NIAC that have, have, have tended to argue in favor of conflating the two bodies, uh, that is, that applicable to IAC and NIAC, uh, carry that torch sometimes. It's attractive, but let me say this about it. I think it confuses conduct and status. It's difficult, I, I found, to speak and to write consistently about status without straying into conduct. I, I was encouraged by Wolf's comments earlier this morning that, that what we're really concerned about is we feel the need to develop a rule that limits government's participation or tells governments who they may and may not send into battle in non-international armed conflict that it's really not the status of those persons that we're actually concerned with. What we're concerned with is their conduct, that we want to assure ourselves uh, that they will conduct themselves in accordance with applicable norms. If we do this trick uh, that I just outlined, where we derive this rule that limits states' participation on the basis of distinction, you know, we may accomplish some of these humanitarian goals, uh, but I doubt seriously that we're really talking about status at that point any longer. And if we reduce it back to status, that is if we reorient the discussion to a concern about the identity and affiliation of government forces uh, and that bearing on their lawful, the lawfulness of their, this participation, we develop a rule that's both overbroad and over, overly narrow. Secondly, I think we create a, 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 a curious incentive structure for states. Uh, what that rule would tell me as a state is, well, look, if you've got someone that you really want to employ in a non-international armed conflict, and I've got to, and I'm limited in terms of the persons I'm allowed to send in to this conflict, well, you know, how hard would it be for me to merely deputize that person, to go through this empty legal formalism and say, okay, I'm now incorporating all my Title 50 personnel, all my intelligence personnel into the armed forces. And if I find another group's uh, contributions to this non-international armed conflict advantageous, well, I'll just incorporate them too. And we'll, it's a matter of a couple signatures and, and we'll, we'll throw some ribbons on it and, and some, some seals and make it look official. I, I think it, so the response in short is I, I think it invites a, an empty legal formalism there, the, this, this system of deputizing. Uh, finally, uh, I, 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 my outlook on that proposal, this, this distinction-based proposal for deriving a rule that limits government actors' participation uh, is derived from my sense that, you, that states will just come at this so differently. Uh, I think one of the impediments to uh, development of the law of non-international armed conflict has to be that state actors simply don't have as much common ground when they face these conflicts as they do when they face one another uh, in international armed conflict. 
Uh, so some, some clothing, closing thoughts here. Uh, ultimately, I think I, I appreciate the assignment of this topic. It, it has made me think about the law of non-international armed conflict in ways that I, I simply hadn't previously, and it is much more complex than I, than I had initially uh, suspected. In the end, I'm left with the impression that what one ultimately has to do, uh, I think, to sketch out and ultimately to defend a position on the status of government armed forces in NIAC is to make a series of choices. The first choice, it seems, uh, has to be uh, how you conceive of status. If you conceive of status, much as international armed conflict does, as a gateway to humanitarian protections. If it is, I mean, after all, status is merely an instrumentality. It's not worth much of itself. Status is relevant. We think about status as lawyers. We get questions from commanders as lawyers because status gives way to other things. It brings about protections. It gives rise to uh, obligations uh, and to responsibilities. Uh, so you could think of status, I suppose, in those humanitarian terms, and perhaps that would lead one to the conclusion that I outlined with reference to distinction. Uh, on the other hand, one might continue, as I think states still do, to conceive of status in much more political terms, that although the international law of international armed conflict uses status to dole out humanitarian protections, when it is dealing with this peculiar and particular status uh, of combatancy or, or of unprivileged belligerency or of unlawful combatancy, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm in this camp that views those terms quite skeptically in the international law uh, or in the law of international armed conflict as well. Well, you know, this is, these are politically laden uh, versions of status. They no longer have much to do with the implementation of humanity in war and have much more to do with the political relationship between states or the political relationship uh, between fighters uh, for the government and fighters for rebel or insurgent groups. My last uh, conclusion, uh, this is one reinforced uh, by this morning's proceedings, is that this is a topic that forces us to think, I think, as you say, Bello lawyers, forces us to think perhaps on a more theoretical level than we're used to. Uh, use and Bello lawyers are, are frequently in academia uh, indicted as, as having under-theorized uh, their area, the, that we, don't, we haven't developed sufficient uh, comprehensive theories for what, for what we do. Uh, and my, I'm sure next fall I'll hear from my uh, tenure advisement committee uh, the, the same thing. Uh, but look, I, I do think, uh, and it's excusable perhaps, right? I mean, if you're a use and bellow lawyer or if you're a military lawyer, you have very practical and important descriptive challenges that we face in this, in this area of law. But this may be an area where, uh, where a discussion of theory, a discussion where we are perhaps more, more clear about what we mean by international law or what we expect of international law, we, what it seemed was going on this morning was that there was a, a disconnect or a disagreement, not only about the law that the conversants were reading, but in the way that they would read the same law, that uh, some come to international law requiring a higher burden of proof or a burden of production. Look, you must show me more in order to convince me that a norm really has attained the status of international law. And, and I suspect that this question of government forces involvement in non-international armed conflict is one of these areas where a, a bit more theory might, might help us. So thank you. Thank you, Professor Watts. And lastly, we hear from Stephen Popper, as I mentioned before, the Assistant Legal Advisor for Political Military Affairs in the Department of State's Office of Legal Advisor. <clears throat> so thanks a lot, and um, thank you to uh, Sean and Mike for um, really uh, tremendous presentations, and, uh, and to the War College for convening this uh, excellent event, at which you have put me in the anchor role for the post-lunch panel. So uh, I'm looking out there at you and trying to figure out what I can do to, to liven this up, but I think maybe making it move quickly will be the best gift I can give. Um, I do want to actually use one minute of my time to come back to a couple of issues uh, that came up this morning. Um, I, I should qualify that I am speaking in my personal capacity, as, as everyone here is, um, and my views are not necessarily those of the Department of State or the U.S. government. Nevertheless, I'm going to sound a lot like a government lawyer when I say, um, in reference to Professor Garraway's characterization 
of the U.S. government position that uh, we're in war with uh, every terrorist everywhere in the world, that that actually hasn't been the U.S. government position for, uh, I don't know if it was ever the U.S. government position, but it was a, you know, affirmatively uh, 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 discarded as a, any kind of position we wanted to be associated with at least five years ago. And that if you look at our, uh, for example, our pleadings, um, in the Guantanamo habeas litigation, it's very clear that the conflict as we envisage it uh, is with um, uh, Al-Qaeda, the Taliban, and associated forces who are defined as, as co-belligerents of those groups. Um, I also want to come back and just make sure that there isn't any misunderstanding um, with respect to some of the remarks um, that uh, the legal advisor made, uh, both uh, at the American Society of International Law, and some of those were excerpted in an Opinio Juris blog um, about the killing of Osama bin Laden. Um, with respect to um, the rules regulating the use of force, um, you know, two alternative paradigms uh, were, were presented. One, uh, that it could be um, um, regarded as lawful within the framework of the armed conflict that the United States is currently engaged in with those groups that I just mentioned. So, alternatively, that it could be reviewed as lawful as an exercise of, of self-defense. In either case, though, we would regard, uh, in, 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 in the, in the self-defense case, in addition to the laws of armed conflict, uh, we would regard the use of vellum uh, principles of necessity and proportionality as, as applicable. But I, I didn't want to leave anybody with the impression that we wouldn't also, or that there was some uh, sense that by uh, referencing self-defense, we were trying to suggest that rules of distinction and proportionality as they uh, come up in the uh, use and bellow context were somehow inapplicable. And then finally, um, I, you know, I found a huge amount of agreement uh, with in what uh, uh, Mike and Sean just uh, dis discussed, but um, one issue um, uh, that, uh, that, that sort of caught my ear was the suggestion that we might try and derive from the principle of distinction um, rules that would regulate the conduct of, of government actors in non-international armed conflict. I think it's one thing to try and craft a rule and say uh, this is consistent with the principle of distinction or it's just a good idea for a rule, but to suggest that there's actually law out there already from which this can be elicited I think probably uh, goes further than law or practice would support. Um, so having said all that, and moving into the substance of my own presentation, which sadly echoes a lot of the substance of Mike's presentation, um, I think everybody uh, shares the premise here that, um, that the rules governing the conduct of the parties uh, to a non-international armed conflict are obviously less developed than those governing uh, parties to international armed conflicts between states. And there are a range of historical and political reasons for this, but as we face the challenge of applying the law of armed conflict, to, to our, the United States current conflict with Al-Qaeda and associated forces, I think there's also an important structural reason, and that's, that's something that Mike was getting into, and, and that is that, well, I think we could all agree on certain core principles of, of IHL that apply uh, beyond what's expressly codified in common Article Three and additional Protocol Two, uh, rules of proportionality and distinction, the prohibition on the denial of quarter, et cetera. As soon as we seek to apply these uh, principles in non-international armed conflict, we confront a hurdle, which is how do we identify the actors to whom we're applying them? Uh, there isn't really a lot of treaty law in this uh, out there. There are terms in the treaty law, direct participation in hostility, organized armed groups, and there's some commentary, most of which I think Mike um, uh, did a very good job of, of explicating. There's also some commentary in uh, to Article 13.3 of uh, the second additional protocol that speaks of uh, people belonging to organized armed groups being targetable at, um, at any point. But um, in any event, it, it, that's as far as it goes. Um, and while in some ways we resist um, any equivalency between the renegade groups we're fighting in these NIACs and uniformed state militaries operating under right authority, we actually do need, and I think Sean got at this, to do some analogizing um, in order to get a clear sense of the entities we're facing um, to get a sense of you know, whether and why they are in fact uh, deemable parties to a conflict and who constitutes their membership. And these questions are incredibly important and they're also very difficult. They're difficult because the amorphous and clandestine nation of these uh, nature of these organizations and the often uh, mercurial nature of the relationship uh, between the members of the organizations um, challenge our instinctive desire as lawyers to draw very tight parallels between uh, the clearly drawn actors that we're used to dealing with in international armed conflicts, you know, uniformed soldiers, declared enemies and neutrals with legal personality, et cetera, and, and the entities that we're dealing with in non-international armed conflict. Um, the parallels are there, I'd submit, 
but they're not as tidy as we want them to be. And, and at the same time, operators will tell us that if we try to be too rigid or tidy in the way that we draw them, then we actually impede their ability to meet the threat that they're facing. At the same time, we can't really understate <laughs> the other side of the equation, the importance of, of coming up with some rules in this area um, uh, and some criteria for, for this identification exercise. I mean, first, the way in which we address these questions bears on extraordinary deprivations of life and liberty. In a military context where the state has the authority to act outside the checks and balances that accompany the kinds of deprivations that we're talking about in ordinary life. So if we fail to draw persuasive parallels, we do run the risk of appearing to act arbitrarily. And at the same time, I think it's important uh, for both legal and operational clarity. Because as you know, we shift increasingly our responsibility to the military for counterterrorism activities, at least in the United States, we've done this. Um, we do owe it to those who are serving to articulate a clear legal framework within which to act. This is important for essentially the same reason that the law of armed conflict has long been a critical component of military culture, including because it channels the application of military power constructively, and it helps provide a foundation for the maintenance of order and discipline in our military operations, and it helps preserve the, uh, the humanity of our troops in the conduct of war. So it's not surprisingly the case that some of these identification definitional issues in recent years have been at the center of some very important legal conversations. Um, in the Guantanamo habeas litigation, the US government has been required to articulate in numerous pleadings what it means to be part of Al Qaeda, the Taliban, or associated forces. And the US federal courts, at least within the district of, um, uh, uh, of Washington, DC, the DC circuit, um, have built up some jurisprudence in this area. And of course, there have also been uh, efforts to synthesize expert opinion on these questions, uh, notably, if not you know, fully successfully, um, in the ICRC interpretive guidance that was released in 2009. And of course, states have also been talking to each other um, about their experience, some of which, of course, is shared experience in places like Afghanistan, Iraq, and Libya. So the purpose of, of what I'm gonna try and do in, in my remaining time, is to touch briefly on the way in which the, these conversations um, have developed on the question of when a civilian loses protection from attack, either through membership in what Mike described as other organized armed groups. I'm not gonna uh, talk about dissident groups or, um, um, or state groups here, um, or through um, direct participation in, uh, in hostilities. And I'm gonna offer some thoughts about why this question appears for the time being to rest largely in the hands of states, and in particular, the executive branches of states. And I'm also gonna give a sense of where I think uh, some of the like-minded states with which the United States government has uh, worked particularly closely um, are converging in their views on this issue, um, as well as uh, identify some areas where there remains a range of perspectives. Um, in order to keep this presentation to a manageable length, I'm gonna uh, keep a fairly narrow focus on that question, though. Um, I'm not gonna talk about uh, some of the issues that Mike uh, got through much more efficiently than I would about what constitutes an organized armed group, uh, what makes an organized armed group a party to a conflict, what is an armed conflict, what are the geographic constraints on armed conflicts, et cetera. Okay, so let me talk a little bit about the Guantanamo litigation. Um, when in spring 2008, the US Supreme Court decided in the Boumediene case that uh, Guantanamo detainees would have an opportunity to challenge the legality of their detention in US federal court, but they didn't, but at the same time didn't address the standard for who could be detained, uh, the court appeared to leave lower courts poised to engage in a sustained inquiry into the question of who it is that forms part of an organized armed group like Al Qaeda or the Taliban or their associated forces. The issue came uh, most pointedly to a head when shortly after the presentation, <coughs> excuse me, when shortly after the present administration came into office, uh, District Court Judge Bates asked the government to file a brief in the Hamlily case describing its interpretation of its, uh, of its detention authority under the 2001 authorization for the use of military force. Uh, the US government responded with its brief of March 13th, 2009, which argued, among other things, that when giving content to the broad language of the AUMF, consistent with the Supreme Court's 2004 Hamdi decision, uh, the government would look to the principles of the laws of armed conflict. And second, that because of the lack of codification in the law of armed conflict relating to non-state actors, it would sometimes be necessary to draw analogies to the international laws of war applicable 
to international armed conflicts between states. The brief then asserted in relevant part that when viewed through this lens, the US government had the right in the present conflict to hold individuals who were part of or substantially supporting Al Qaeda, the Taliban, or associated forces, but left to be explored in future cases what the precise contours of those terms would be. So, two years later, and roughly uh, 50 trial and appellate court decisions behind us, what do we see? As concerns the topic of this presentation, I guess my own view is that what we see is an increasingly clear picture that, certainly at the appellate level, the courts really have little or no interest in becoming the laboratory in which the meets and bounds of armed group membership are worked out. Uh, this was not always the case. Initially, the district courts wrestled pretty squarely with the membership issue in the context of the law of armed conflict. Notably, the 2009 Hamley decision by Judge Bates and Garrity decision by Judge Walton uh, accepted that detention based on membership status was consistent with the law of armed conflict, but said that individuals had to be part of a group's command structure to have this status. There was arguably some distance between these two opinions on some technical issues, but they were basically operating very much within this framework, international law of armed conflict, as were a number of later trial court opinions that you know, also varied in terms of their rigor, but essentially accepted this, this legal framework as, as the relevant analytic framework. The appellate court, however, has taken a decidedly different approach. Um, with respect to international law, uh, the focus is considerably diminished. Um, while the law hasn't completely settled yet, at least one panel of the DC Circuit in the Bahani case overtly dismissed the relevance of international law at all to the interpretation of the AUMF. And while that aspect of the opinion was effectively overruled by an en banc decision of the same court that described it as dictum, um, I do think that the Bahani panel decision marks a clear in disinclination by at least some of the judges on the DC Circuit to use international law of armed conflict as a tool with which to excavate the meaning of armed group membership or actually any other aspect of the AUMF. Also, evidentiary focus. Um, at the same time, um, the appellate court continues to offer its views about what sorts of fact patterns would suffice to establish detention authority for AUMF purposes. It's, it's more and more looking at the question through an evidentiary lens, focusing less on the theoretical question of what defines membership and more on the question of, did the government make a sufficient showing to meet its burden in this case? And I think, moreover, even as the DC Circuit increasingly focuses on what the evidentiary burden is, its rulings on this subject clearly create a very substantial zone of deference for military judgment. Uh, for example, in the Al-Adahi decision, the circuit rejected trial court views that items of evidence must be judged independent of each other, and instead required that they be looked at as a mosaic in which various items are taken as corroborating each other, even if not fully proven on their independent merits. And in the very recent Elmer Fetty decision, the DC Circuit actively questioned whether the preponderance of the evidence standard that is applied to the government in uh, proving detainability in Guantanamo habeas litigation to date is in fact necessary or place, might even place too much of a burden on the government and suggested that a credible evidence standard for an initial showing which could then be rebutted by the petitioner, petitioner might be sufficient under the Supreme Court's 2004 Hamdi ruling. The message seems to be pretty clear that so long as the US government can show a credible basis for its actions, the court is not going to second guess its military judgment. Now in the past, the Supreme Court, rather than the DC Circuit, has very much had the final word on the extension of key rights and privileges to the Guantanamo detainee uh, population. But there is some reason to believe that the court may not weigh in as dramatically uh, in this phase of the litigation as it has in the past. The composition of the court has changed since the path-breaking decisions of 2004, 2006, and 2008, and so have the atmospherics. Uh, criticism of detainee review procedures and treatment issues, um, which may very well have drawn uh, drawn the court's attention in the past have, I think, largely been addressed over the past years through a combination of judicial and executive acts. Moreover, it can't escape the court's notice that of the political branches, the executive branch has recently actually been the more restrained of the two branches, uh, you know, certainly when compared to a Congress, which has been actively seeking to legislate rules that would guide more individuals into military detention by closing off Article III courts to certain types of terrorism suspects. Now, whether a set of facts or or an issue of law might draw the court's attention and be deemed cert-worthy is, of course, anybody's guess. But I, I at least wouldn't be shocked if the court uh, continues in its current posture of some reserve with respect to these issues. 
<clears throat> now, of course, this whole exercise has occurred in the detention context, and there are questions about whether issues relating to targeting as opposed to detention in the context of an armed conflict would even be justiciable. But even if they were, I, I think the bottom line is, even if we were to regard the detention uh, decisions as being about targeting as well, um, the, the DC Circuit is now in a place that leaves the executive branch in an enormous um, amount of flexibility to exercise reasonable judgment. So I'm gonna turn now, um, having sort of tried to make the case that the courts are not gonna be the place that decide this, at least from the US government's perspective, um, I'm going to turn to the, uh, uh, to, to the possibility that an experts process might do that. And here, I think, you know, front and center is the ICRC interpretive guidance on direct participation in hostilities, which has been, you know, obviously amply discussed, so I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time talking about it today. Um, you know, by way of very quick background for anybody um, who hasn't <laughs> been to any of these conferences before, um, in 2003, the ICRC, as well as the ASR Institute, mounted an effort to provide guidance on the question of when civilians lose their immunity from attack in both international and non-international armed conflicts. And they convened an experts group to study the question and produce a report, and as Mike described, among the main findings of the report were that individuals perform a continuous combat function, which is a role that involves direct participation in hostilities on a non-unorganized, non-sporadic, and non-spontaneous basis on behalf of the military wing of an organized armed group that is a party to a conflict become targetable on the basis of their status as members until their status changes. Um, and with regard to direct participation in hostilities, the study also found um, that three components must be present in order for an action to constitute DPH. Um, it, it must meet a threshold of harm requirement, there must be causation, and there must be a belligerent nexus, i.e. a sufficient connection between the action and the armed conflict. Each one of these criteria is explored at length, and there are fairly extensive list of activities that would or would not satisfy the criteria as conceived by the study. Now, um, I'm among those who think that the uh, study really makes a significant contribution to the literature, but it's also obviously the case that it hasn't become the gold standard that might originally have been hoped for, for a range of reasons that I really don't think need to be further explored here, but have to do with uh, the famous section nine, which sets out a um, uh, least harmful use of force standard that suggests that there are restraints um, on the use of force uh, that can lawfully be uh, used against the lawful target in the context of an armed conflict. I think another issue, frankly, is the level of detail and complexity in the report, um, some of which is in the form of very fine-grained, difficult uh, to implement rules and distinctions um, that, from the operational perspective, I think were just re you know, regarded as not being especially realistic. And then I think, you know, at the foundation of, of all these uh, issues is the fact that the process was not fundamentally led by states. And it, an issue of this sensitivity um, and importance to states, um, you know, that is ultimately going to be a feature, uh, I mean, a, an incredibly important feature of what succeeds in this area. Um, so having said that, I'm going to come back and say one more kind word about it, which is um, if in critiquing the study, we could lose sight of two very important contributions that it's made. Substantively, I think it's important to acknowledge that the study is in some ways pathbreaking in the level of recognition that it gives to the concept that organized armed group members lose their civilian status permanently during a non-international armed conflict and can be targeted on the basis of that status. And I think procedurally, the report has provoked um, important discussion among states about how um, uh, their interpretation of their law and their observations of state practice match up to its contents. And indeed, my sense is that there is an emerging spectrum of views on this very subject among the US government and some of its uh, close partners, and I'd like to turn to that, that now. So when the uh, ICR state study came out, one reaction that at least some of its readership offered, and that I offered in any event, was that it would take some time for states to digest its contents and provide some feedback on uh, where it tracked and did not track state practice. And that has actually been happening. Um, uh, uh, the, the issue of membership and the issue of DPH have been a topic of conversation among the US government and its partners. And while I can't say uh, that we've officially crystallized a common set of views on this issue, it is my sense that we are heading towards some areas of common ground on some of the topics that were addressed by the ICRC study, as well as a growing understanding of those areas where there is still a range of views. Um, I hope in time to be able to lay those out a bit s more schematically, but for purposes of today's presentation, I'll just describe a couple of the uh, key elements in somewhat abbreviated form. Um, first, some overarching principles. I think probably most important, I do think that there is a strong sense um, among the group that I'm describing 
that there are two principal ways in which an individual may become liable to attack on the non-state side of an armed conflict. Uh, individuals may be liable to attack if either they become members of an organized armed group or if they are taking direct part in hostilities without belonging to an organized armed group. The critical difference between individuals who lose their protection from attack because of their membership in an organized armed group and individuals who lose such protection as a result of direct participation in hostilities without belonging to an organized armed group is that an individual who loses his protection because of membership can be attacked at any time. Because his membership deprives him of uh, protection, that individual does not need to be involved in particular hostilities at a particular moment to be lawfully attacked. Now, there may be some nuanced differences of view among the um, uh, folks with whom we've been consulting about whether this is because the individual actually loses his civilian status or because he's deemed to be continuously directly participating in hostilities and therefore never gets to enjoy the benefit of the civilian status. But the net effect with respect to targeting, I think, is the same. Um, by contrast, uh, a civilian who is not a member of an organized armed group and is taking direct uh, part in hostilities loses protection from attack only for so long as his participation lasts. I think there's also a common view that a determination about whether an individual is a member or has ceased to be a member of an organized armed group or is taking direct part in hostilities has to be taken by the decision maker based on information that is reasonably available at the time. In this connection, while there is a range of views on the specific level of doubt that would preclude action from being taken, there's obviously consensus that individuals taking targeting decisions may not act in the absence of sufficient confidence in the information establishing the factual basis for the decision. And there additionally appears to be agreement that the question of whether an individual is liable to attack either because of membership or direct participation in hostilities is separate from the question of whether that individual should benefit from combat and combatant immunity and also from the question of whether or not the individual may be detained as the scope of detention authorities in armed conflict are different from the scope of targeting authorities. So what does membership in an organized armed group mean? Um, as to whether an individual has become a member of an organized armed group, um, while there is a range of views on the appropriate test for membership, and, that this, and this can have an effect on how the relevant considerations are weighed, I do think there's a shared sense that the following considerations may bear on, on such a determination. One consideration is the extent to which an individual performs a function on behalf of an organized armed group that is both analogous to a function traditionally performed by a member of a state military who is liable to attack and, and that is performed within the command structure of the organization. Another consideration is the frequency and intensity of the individual's preparation, command, or execution of operations amounting to direct participation in hostilities. And other considerations may include factors determining the reasonable military judgment of the decision maker to demonstrate an individual's integration into the organized armed group, such as the adoption of a rank, title, or style of communication, the taking of an oath of loyalty, et cetera. While there is a range of views with respect to the significance of combat support, combat service support, and indications of formal membership and assessing membership, there seems to be consensus about the relevant factors in determining that an individual has ceased to be a member of an organized armed group. These include the amount of time that has passed since that individual has taken relevant action on behalf of the group in question, and also whether the individual has affirmatively dissociated himself from the organized armed group. Now, uh, lastly, I'll say a few words about what factors are weighed in determining that an individual is directly participating in hostilities. As to whether an individual is, uh, is directly participating in hostilities and therefore can be attacked for the duration of the act, there does seem to be an emerging common sense that the following considerations should be taken into account. First, what is the nature of the harm? Is the individual's activity directed at adversely affecting one party's military capacity or operations or enhancing the capacity and operations of the other or at killing, injuring, or damaging civilian objects or purpose, persons? Second, causation. Is there a sufficient causal link between the individual's relevant act and the relevant harm, or does the act otherwise form an integral part of coordinated action resulting in that harm? Um, it, while it's not enough that the act merely occurs during the hostilities, there isn't a requirement that the act only be a single causal step removed from the harm. And finally, nexus to hostilities. Is the individual's activity linked to an ongoing armed conflict, and is it intended either to disadvantage one party or advance the interests of an opposing party in that conflict? Uh, the period during which an individual can be deemed to be directly participating in hostilities includes the period during which that individual is deploying to and returning from the hostile act. Everybody seems to agree on that. Uh, with respect to the foregoing factors, however, there's a range of views about a number of things, including 
how the factors should be weighed in making a determination of whether an individual is directly participating in hostilities, with some requiring a showing of all three factors in all cases and others favoring a more flexible uh, totality of the circumstances approach. Um, also, whether certain types of activities should be categorically excluded, um, uh, including, for example, financial support. Um, the relevance of geographic and temporal proximity to an individual's actions. And finally, whether the acquisition of materials necessary for an attack and the period in which an individual goes into hiding following an attack might, under certain circumstances, be part of deployment and return, respectively. So some uh, concluding thoughts. Um, DPH aficionados will note that in many ways, what I've just offered up um, really clusters around many of the concepts that the ICRC put forward in its DPH study. Um, it presents two roads to loss of immunity uh, membership in DPH. Um, some among the considerations that bear on membership, although not, uh, it's not limited in this regard, it does look at functional factors that echo some of the factors that the ICRC incorporates in its test for functional membership. It obviously looks at other factors too. And the factors that con contribute to an assessment of uh, direct participation in hostilities parallel to some extent the three factors that were captured in the DPH study. There are, however, important differences between the approach I just described and the ICRC sub uh, study. It's obviously less complex, it's more operationally flexible, and it, reflects the, um, it, and it reflects the absence of anything like Section 9 um, in light of the fact that there just doesn't seem to be any support for that among, uh, among the states that we've di uh, discussed this with. Um, so to circle back where we started, I, I at least find it encouraging that we're seeing the emergence of a uh, common set of perspectives from like-minded states on the question of how individuals lose immunity from direct attack uh, in the context of non-international armed conflicts. And moreover, while there isn't 100% agreement on every issue, um, there is a defined spectrum um, of, of ranges of views that's also emerging. Um, and, I, and I guess I'll just conclude with the thought that for those who believe that the crystallization of state practice in this area can uh, further a uh, better articulated common framework for the application of the law of armed conflict in non-international armed conflict, I think this should all come as fairly welcome news. Thank you, Steve. And uh, we have 20 minutes for questions. Sir. Good afternoon. Uh, my question is mainly directed to, toward Professor Watts and some comments he made, but I'm also interested to hear what the other panelists have to say as well. Uh, you made some, uh, I don't know if I want to use the word derogatory, comments about how the politics of the, of the sovereign system seems to be interplaying with these determinations about status and, and conduct and so forth, and you actually use the term empty legal formalities. Uh, just that the president can sign a paper, uh, and it seems to me, and you know, forgive me because I'm a uniform guy, so that means a lot to me about when the president signs papers and all that, but uh, you know, the law of armed conflict is about what is in the interest of states primarily, not individuals or other non-state groups. You know, it, it has been established by states and, and status is actually the key to this because it's conferred by sovereign legitimacy. And that's what hasn't been addressed by the panel and which was sort of skirted in the morning session as well, is that this is why NIAC seems to be, at least in my opinion, seems to be so underdeveloped to begin with is that because the states who are the primary actors and the ones with the primary interests in developing these treaties, they can't agree to what level of legitimacy they want to confer on these other non-state actors' um, conduct and on, on them as their, on, on their status, not their conduct. So what they're left with is articulating what is targetable conduct. Even when you're talking about this group, the Al-Qaeda or the Taliban, we're more concerned with targeting the Taliban because of their conduct and they're giving safe haven to the Al-Qaeda and similarly situated groups. We're concerned about targeting the Al-Qaeda not because of their ideology or because they had any desire to have control of a particular area, but because of certain conduct they took that was contrary to our security interests. So I'd like to know how do you address that? Um, because to me, status and sovereign legitimacy is the key. If, you, if, we're gonna li if we still live in a world, you know, in the Westphalian models of, of sovereignty, and if, those, if that means anything, then I think that's where the real problem is with, when you start talking about trying to determine who's targetable, who's detainable, under what conditions, what laws apply. Uh, I mean, and uh, Professor Watts, you even said yourself the law of NIAC is evolving, so that seems to have, you know, until the states decide – 
what kind of legitimacy they want to give, I think that's where your, where your problem is in making these determinations. And in fact, that was the whole reason we didn't sign on to, the United States didn't sign on to the additional protocols because of the practical difficulties that were presented with a lot of these things like the DPH determinations. Uh, thank you, and uh, could you just please identify yourself, just so we know? I'm sorry, my name is uh, Captain Errol Enriquez. I'm the uh, legal advisor to the DCNO for strategy, policy, and operations. Thank you. Uh, any other questions uh, we'll take here? Just, uh, sir? Just a question, agree to which, uh, you know, status for the purpose of detention versus uh, status, and it, or whether it's relevant at all for the purpose of targeting, and the definition that there is in the U.S. Commission's Act about uh, who qualifies as a uh, unprivileged belligerent, uh, including material support and the breadth of that in relation to what might constitute direct participation in hostilities. And it, as to whether that could, has the potential to create confusion with respect to who might be targetable. Okay, I'll take Ken's uh, question. Um, so, right, the jurisdictional provisions of the Military Commissions Act, uh, you know, incorporate this concept of material support. It wasn't actually. Um, incorporated in, uh, we use different phraseology and uh, uh, in the, um, uh, the March 13th brief when explaining the government's interpretation of its detention authority under the AUMF. Um, the DC Circuit then brought the material support language into its interpretation of the government's detention authority um, subsequently, um, arguing that um, if military commissions uh, had jurisdiction over individuals who provide material support, then the government must have indefinite detention authority with respect to these individuals. Um, that is now the law of the D.C. Circuit. Um, but I guess, I, you know, I would say, Ken, it's, it's a difficult question because, um, uh, you know, if you go back to sort of, I think, the Hamdi decision, um, the idea that the government has detention authority under the AUMF was, you know, fused to the idea that it was a piece of our use of force authority. Um, and that it flowed from that under the laws of armed conflict. But I, I do get the sense that, you know, for the reasons I described, um, given that the way that the D.C. Circuit is going, I, I would hesitate to draw um, sort of definitive conclusions about the meets and bounds of our targeting authority based on what the D.C. Circuit says our detention authority are. I'm not sure they're thinking about it in precisely that way. I'm not sure we would agree that targeting decisions are necessarily even justiciable by the courts. And I, and I really do think that these DC Circuit decisions are now almost as much about um, you know, evidentiary burden and creating a zone of, of deference to the, to, to the executive as they are about substantive standards. But that's, that's just my reading of, of all the, of the case law. You know, not a uh, sufficiently established international law scholar to be known for a view or a thing, um, but I, I will say this is probably the first instance where I've been accused of being insufficiently attentive to sovereignty. I mean, that's kind of what I hang my hat on. But uh, I, I, what I suppose I meant by the, the comment on ent empty legal formalism is that I suspect that would be the state, the response of states. And the response, as you suggest, Responses of states in international law matter, um, but you know, by by it being characterized as empty formalism, this notion that that some government official would say, "Boy, it would really be nice if the CIA could help us out on this mission. Well, let's just deputize them. Let's just get them into the armed forces." You know, the empty part isn't that it's not legally binding; that, it, that the persons that were subject to that incorporation wouldn't do what they were told. It's that you know, this wouldn't solve any international law problems. That if what motivates concern that states have too free a hand in, in who they choose to participate in these non-international armed conflicts, well, you know, I do, I, I, I'm forecasting with that comment what I think states would likely do, uh, and that's important to me and that's relevant, but it's only empty in that it wouldn't address the, the humanitarian concerns that I presume would, would motivate. 
we still have some time for questions. Anything else, sir? Uh, I'm Major Todd Pierce. Uh, my question is primarily for Mr. Pomper. Uh, if, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the original AUMF provided that the President had authority to use military force against Al Qaeda and the Taliban. Uh, again, correct me if I'm wrong, but now you, you repeatedly use the term uh, Al Qaeda, Taliban, and associated forces. Uh, so I guess my question is, uh, again, unless I'm wrong, but where did the term associated forces enter into the AUMF? I know the uh, current Congress is in the process of passing, expanding the AUMF to include associated forces, but you've been repeating it as if it's already law. Is that something that's been imported into the law by the D.C. Circuit? And then second, would you, uh, somebody else earlier, I believe uh, Mr. Chang maybe disparaged uh, or so mocked the idea of the global war on terror. But uh, unless you can tell me that there's some limit to associated forces, then haven't we just uh, exchanged the term global war on terror for what somebody might see as a, now a uh, global war on associated forces that's even more expansive and could even reach, uh, uh, depending, uh, perhaps some uh, uh, Muslim in London who's got a picture of Al-Qaeda uh, Al or Osama bin Laden on his wall. How, you know, what's the limits on that? organizations, nations that planned, authorized, committed, or aided in the September 11th attack, and those who gave them harbor. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously the Taliban and, the, uh, and, and Al Qaeda were implicated there. Um, the theory that has emerged through some academic literature and also in the course of our uh, Guantanamo habeas uh, litigation is that um, groups that subsequently allied themselves or came into the fight basically on the side of Al-Qaeda and the Taliban um, are also part of the same conflict that was authorized under the AUMF. Um, the term that I think the technical term we use in the pleadings is co-belligerency. So associated forces are belligerents that have come into the fight alongside Al-Qaeda and the Taliban, essentially. And um, that is not an infinite universe of groups. It certainly doesn't include every terrorist group in the world, and people who have you know, photographs of Osama bin Laden on their wall. Um, it, you know, it involves groups that are part of the conflict. Um, and uh, I think, in fact, I'm sure that that concept has been ratified by the courts. So, I mean, uh, you know, Congress is thinking about it, but in fact, that's an authority that has already been confirmed, and there are people who are uh, in law board detention at Guantanamo for their uh, participation in the conflict as members of these associated groups whose um, habeas cases the government has won. I wanted to ask a question, uh, Pnena Sharvit Baruch, who used to be the head of the International Law Department in the IDF. And I wanted to ask a question about the issue of the status of, of the, those armed forces acting on, the, on behalf of the government, and from two perspectives. First, from the perspective of the other side's obligations. We're not talking so much about the obligation of the non-state party. And what would be their obligation with con concerning a soldier detained by them? what status or what rights and obligations, what r obligations uh, do they have uh, towards such a person? And secondly, on the, on, the, uh, on the side of what can they do, how does um, the fact that the other side is not operating as a, uh, in uniform or in, an organi or in such uh, situations, uh, uh, according to the distinction uh, um, principle, how does that affect uh, the issue of operating in civilian clothes. I mean, we're talking about the status of the people, maybe part of the armed forces, but is it, does that affect their obligation uh, to act uh, uh, in uniform or can they, in such situations, act also uh, in civilian clothes? 
realization that they are not, or this reality that they're not dealing with a legal peer uh, when they enter into these armed conflicts fuels the state's expectations in that regard and, and has to inform your understanding of the law. You know, the, the, the question of the extent to which uh, non-state actors are bound by the law of non-international armed conflict is interesting that you know, there is some literature out there on it. Uh, personally, I, I subscribe to the notion that they, they can be bound by it as nationals of the state that, that entered into the agreement as a high contracting party, perhaps not surprisingly. I'll, I'll be simpler still. There is no obligation to wear a uniform in Iraq. None. And the fact that the other side doesn't, I mean, it's, this is relatively well established. We're not talking IAC. And, and treatment and status quo do not depend on the word. Any other questions? We still have a few minutes. Sir. What does the panel, George Walker speaking, what does the panel think about what I might call the minute man uh, on the side, say, of your, uh, your rebels who has the flintlock over the mantelpiece and goes off to war and the next day he's a farmer or a business person versus, say, the same sort of person, maybe a reservist who is or is not eligible for uh, conflict uh, on the side of, if you will, state forces? You know, you, you have these folks going in. Do they go in and out of protection? Do they go, uh, uh, are they constantly subject to attack? I would actually agree with that. Um, uh, uh, the the question of whether or not um, the Minuteman, you know, rises to the level of member, um, you're going to have to look at uh, what he's actually been doing, um, what expressions of loyalty or fealty to the group he's made, um, information about whether or not he responds to or gives command within the uh, within the organization. I think different states will have different perspectives on how much weight they have to give each one of those, you know, criteria. Um, but uh, those would be the kinds of things. That, those would be the kinds of questions you would ask if you were, you know, sort of lawyering that targeting decision. I think. You, you know, George, I, I, I might simply add because we've had this debate. I mean, Hayes Parks talked about this in in his uh, long article, "The Farmer by Day, the Soldier by Night," and so forth. That's not relevant if you otherwise qualify as a member of the organized armed group. That issue is only relevant with regard to the person that doesn't qualify. That's not a criterion of membership. We still have about four minutes. Time for one, uh, yes, sir. Thank you, um, Edwin Williamson. Um, uh, for Professor Smith and uh, Steve Popper, um, 
Uh, to what extent does the, um, this, uh, I guess it's section 1034 of the NDAA that I guess has passed the House, uh, that's basically an expansion of the AUMF, um, or the question is whether it is an expansion of the AUMF, um, how do the criteria on that stack up against the international uh, definition of, um, of, of target? And um, Steve, I take it from the um, U.S. from the U.S. domestic standpoint, then um, that this would be further reason for the U.S. courts to step back and not get involved. And if they're not inclined to look to international law in the first place, it seems to me they'd be less inclined after this. I, I mean, I guess I, 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 my concern about it is um, the U.S. government really couldn't be in a much better position from from the litigation perspective, and um, you know the idea that a, a, a new statute. Um, that disturbs that equilibrium is going to make the world a better place for the government lawyers who <laughs> have been slogging through these cases for low these many years. It, I think is just, I don't think it matches up to um, realistic expectations. I think you disturb any of the language, it's going to create a new wedge for litigation and, and probably not a huge amount of risk unless, you know, they empty out the DC <laughs> circuit bench and repopulate it with a whole new group of people. But still, um, it's going to take more time. I mean, in terms of substance, I think the major difference between um, uh, 1034 and uh, you know sort of the current operating framework is that um, uh, it makes explicit, if I'm not mistaken, uh, a couple of terms um, that we had previously built into our you know interpretations in our in our pleadings, and that the courts have accepted. So they're part of the law of of this set of issues at this point. Uh, they're just part of the case law as opposed to part of the statute. But what but, but it's absolutely correct that, um, uh, you know, whereas the U.S. government in its, uh, in its uh, March 13, 2009 brief um, spoke of interpreting the statute uh, in light of the law of armed conflict, in light of international law, um, that might very well not be um, part of the backdrop against which Congress, um, you know, uh, makes the case that it's legislating here. So um, I don't think, um, you know, in terms of advancing um, the U.S. government's um, ability to say, you know, we are working within an international law framework when we um, when we defend these cases and, and in our detention operations. I mean, we'll continue to do that, but it's not going to help make that case to shift to 1034. 